Not from Ethiopia. Not from Ethiopia. All right. Okay. I would like to understand. I would like to understand. Okay. What it is that the that seems to have altered the stance of the Ethiopian government towards Eritrea. It it happened that we've been discussing this matter uh, a number of um, a few minutes ago. I mean, number one, Eritrea did not get its independence from Ethiopia at all. I mean, we had our just cause. We fought for a long uh, time, for almost three decades, probably half a century. And when 91 came, we said, we're postponing the unilateral declaration of independence to go through a legitimate political process to assure the international community and be assured that we have exercised this right through a referendum. Then people were saying, well, a referendum could be expedited if the Ethiopian government agrees to the referendum process. We said no, not at all. We are not asking for the blessing of the Ethiopian government or anybody else for that matter. We would like to exercise this right through a referendum and we would like the international community to come help us organize and witness the desire or the wish of our population. No one was invite, invited to offer Eritrea independence in a silver platter, not at all. We rejected that all the way. We waited for two years after 1991, 1993, a referendum, fair and free choice of the population was expressed through that referendum. We got our independence. No one gave us our independence. We did not get our independence from anyone not Ethiopia, not Somalia, not Sudan, or even the international community. The international community was there to witness an exercise of free choice of the Eritrean people. I have tried to uh, briefly explain why this government in Ethiopia has trapped itself into, into a karma. People are speculating. Why is this government now uh, changing course? Why this border conflict? Wasn't there an alliance for the last 25 years? Haven't you worked together, sacrificed together? Weren't you comrade in arms? Why this problem now? It's actually a question that has puzzled me for so long and I have not found one clear answer to this matter now. Why? Has the government in Addis Ababa come up with its own claims on what it considers sovereign Ethiopian territory? Have they come with legal agreements or treaties that define the borders between Eritrea and Ethiopia? Have they come up with maps to uh, tell us that they have a new map of Ethiopia? Not at all. I was telling Professor uh, Efren that uh, while we were young, we were provided with uh, exercise books with two landmarks. One was the photograph of Emperor Haile Selassie, and the other map, the other thing was the map of Ethiopia. The map of Ethiopia, which clearly outlined the borders between Eritrea and Ethiopia. At the same time, it outlined the borders of administrative regions in Ethiopia, 13 or 14. This never altered. This map is in the minds of everybody 
uh, who has gone through the last two generations in Ethiopia and Eritrea. What has changed? Nothing has changed. Haile Selassie's government has never changed maps, not at all. In fact, they consolidated the colonial treaties by the maps produced with the assistance of mapping missions from this uh, uh, nation and from other uh, uh, countries. Mengistu came to ally himself with the former Soviet Union and produced maps and maps and maps, but never altered the borders between Eritrea and Ethiopia. What's new? What is the agenda of this government? We are asking, we're still asking this simple question. Is there are border claims on the part of this group in authority in Ethiopia. We'll have to be told one day that the map of Ethiopia is outlined in a manner to either agree or not agree with the international internationally established boundaries and the colonial treaty signed early in this century. Nothing of that sort has come up. And what's this government up to? What is the, the problem? That still is the past. The problem to me is this is a very small group. When it was created in 1975, it never had any agenda for Ethiopia at all. Never. We had to go through a struggle of about five or ten years to convince these people that there is nothing like independence of Tigray. Tigray as a region could not be independent. One can have his own grandiose ideas about his own territory, his own particular region, but that was not realistic. And we had to finally arrive at a point where we convinced them that this is not tenable. They shifted and, well, then again, they were more internationalistic than our uh, uh, perceived uh, uh, understanding of their policies well, no, no problem. We lived with that. We lived with a number of other things. We wanted to see Ethiopia allow its populations to participate in what actually uh, means a new Ethiopia. 1991 came, Mengistu was, was, was ousted. These people began redrawing borders. Yes, within the context of federal Ethiopia and the federal constitution, they had the full right, the ultimate right, and probably the supreme right to redraw administrative boundaries. They did their best to increase or uh, include chunks from a number of other uh, provinces into what they conceived to be Tigray as one unique region in Ethiopia. The mistake they made was when they began redrawing international boundaries. That's where they were trapped, and that's what we call the quagmire. Now they can't get out of that uh, quagmire. They can't extricate themselves out of the cut. They will have to find an explanation for this act of violation. Because it cannot be justified, they're living in uh, a situation of uh, obsession or chain reaction where a mistake is resolved or attempted to be solved by another mistake. A third mistake comes to solve the two previous mistakes. That kind of vicious circle they live in, and that might be an explanation on what these people are up to. But uh, again, is that a persuasive uh, explanation of what we are up to to justify the loss of tens of thousands of lives, both from Eritrea and Ethiopia, to tell us at the end of the day that they were mistaken and they had a misperception about their borders. God knows what finally we'll find out, but we will patiently pursue our policy of dialogue. We'll work with the international community to find a peaceful solution to the problem. We are against the war. We'll try to avoid war, even though we have a legitimate right to self-defense. But again, we find this war a senseless war. After decades of instability, in 2018, Ethria and Ethiopia made a peace deal ultimately centered around growth, commitment for stability. Signatures, toast, hugs were the trending public sign of good faith. The peace deal opened borders which allowed for regional stability. For the first time, the Horn of Africa was able to engage with one another with no alternative agendas.
The agenda was the people. The peace deal for many reunited friends and family. TPLF has been preparing for this eventuality since 2018. They organized and drafted regular militias, not even sparing underage recruits. The regional administration increasingly showed its contempt to federal laws, including the Constitution, and continued pushing a half-cooked de facto statehood thesis. The fugitives within the TPLF have been determined to trigger an armed conflict by attacking the Northern Command of the Federal Armed Force stationed in the Tigray region earlier um, this week, intending to take control of its mechanized weaponry and capability. Few days prior to this attack, the regional administration of Tigray publicly declared that they can dictate terms regarding personal change and movements of the Northern Command, compromising the integrity of the National Defense Force. No federation and constitutional order can tolerate such illegality. That's why the federal government is compelled to undertake a law enforcement operation to defend and protect the constitutional order and uphold the rule of law. A democratic and pluralistic Ethiopia cannot exist without the rule of law. Rule of law, especially in a federal arrangement, requires that both regional states and federal governments respect the constitutional division of power. It is in accordance with this constitutional provision and its duty to enforce federal laws across the whole country that the federal government is undertaking a strategic operation to end impunity and criminality. The federal government counts on all who advocate for justice and rule of law to support this effort. I personally call upon the international community to understand the context and the consistent transgressions by the TPLF clique that have led the federal government to undertake this law enforcement operation that aims to once and for all put an end to impunity and forces aimed at destabilizing the country as well as the region. The Ethiopian people have paid a big price thus far for the criminality of belligerent cliques. Now, we all deserve peace and stability, and this operation aims to end the impunity that has prevailed for years. There should not be any mistake made in treating the federal government as equal with criminal groups. The Constitution mandates the federal government to uphold the rule of law, and to that task we remain committed. Through the instrumentality of a state of emergency, with utmost most care for the overall well-being, safety, and security of our citizens in the regional state, the federal government will see through the law enforcement operation it has commenced. As you have seen, in this presentation, public diplomacy has historically been represented by government officials. This presentation will now highlight activities and accomplishments in the Northeast region of the United States by everyday citizens who are committed to the development of Eritrea in the diaspora. Buffalo, New York, contributed to public diplomacy in the diaspora, having a prestige honor for Mr. Tesfai Kidane 
in naming a street after him for his contributions of bringing an Eritrean Orthodox church to the Buffalo community. This accomplishment engaged the city of Buffalo government officials in recognizing the Eritrean community. Bringing a community pillar and fixture as a church to a city in the USA creates a diaspora platform for the Eritrean community for when such as government officials want to engage with us. It is an institution for public advocacy, an example of victory for the masses. Stanford, Connecticut, and New York City together contributed to public diplomacy in the diaspora by being awarded a proclamation from the city of Stanford by their mayor. This proclamation acknowledged the 30 years toward independence and the many who have fallen to achieve this victory. This accomplishment engaged the city of Stanford government officials in recognizing the history of the Eritrean people. This day included the honor of having the Eritrean flag raised and being awarded with this proclamation, an example of victory for the masses. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania contributed to public diplomacy in the diaspora having their flag for permanent display in Ben Franklin Parkway. A highly visible and frequented tourist attracted for many to see from all over the world. This accomplishment recognizes the sovereignty of our country as being publicly recognized by a city in the U.S. Now many from near and far simply traveling through a major metropolitan area in the U.S. will recognize Eritrean identity and that the Philadelphia area has an advocacy community. Philadelphia has also benefited their diaspora community by creating and maintaining a community center that serves breakfast and hosts community functions for anyone willing to learn about Eritrean people. An example for victory for the masses. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania contributed to public diplomacy in the diaspora by engaging with a U.S. Senator's office and congressman that represent Pennsylvania introducing the history of Eritrean people and present day challenges in the Horn of Africa. These meetings included follow up meetings to further discuss and have adequate dialogue regarding legislation and bill advocacy that government officials can provide and are currently ongoing between the Eritrean community in Harrisburg and the government officials. Harrisburg also discussed with the leadership of WITF, an entity of PBS, regarding the documentary about the Eritrean refugee population. The meeting brought truth and advocacy to their understanding. An example for victory for the masses. Massachusetts contributed to public diplomacy in the diaspora by being awarded three proclamations for three of their Eritrean community cities. These cities include Boston, Malden, and Cambridge. Along with being awarded the proclamations, they also held flag raising ceremonies in their respective cities. They also protested the conflict in the Horn of Africa with the Ethiopian community. They're working with the Ethiopian community 
shows the peace deal expands further than regionally, but globally. An example for victory for the masses. Rochester, New York, contributed to public diplomacy in the diaspora by teaching fifth grade students in the Rochester area about Eritrean history and music. This was even featured in their local news outlet. This accomplishment educates the global community on introducing Eritrean history in the schools and allowing our culture to leave a positive impact at an early age development. An example of victory for the masses. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not